Welcome audience, we'll now, after finishing the part one, we're now going to part two. We continue the same discussion. Uh, from what we started was the economic crisis, understanding demonetization, etc. In the second session, we are looking to understand a little bit more about the politics of it, uh, the superstructures uh, around this politics, and also what we should be doing to archive the dissent, archive our arguments, and how do we go forward from here. These are the things which we're going to discuss in the part two. So stay with us. Thank you again. Yeah. In, in this regard, you pointed out two things. One is the farm law, and little before that, the unemployment, and specifically the sort of government jobs which have been cut, the Agni Veer. And two distinct things came out in India in the last few years. When the farm laws came, the farmers came together, the agitation aggregated the views of the farmer through dissent. What did not happen in the parliament happened in the streets. And it was done um, in, an, if you one could say in a romantic way, a one, wonderful way to tell, although there was loss of farmers, I don't want to romanticize that, but somehow the farm laws were pulled back. Uh, there's some protection right now. Whereas the unemployment is severe, the inflation is severe, the youth agitated, the Agnivir has been implemented, but somehow that part has not got aggregated. We don't see dissent of the same nature and protest. So the discussion, if it had to go outside the parliament onto the streets, which is also a way of democracy, what do you think was the difference between the two or are they really different or are we missing a point between these two really very important problems and somehow very different outcomes came? But you see, um in today's world, especially with today's uh, communication technology, a lot of things need not really spill out onto the streets. If you if you tell the people that you know, look at the look at the inflation, look at unemployment, and you say it is you know seven point two percent inflation, or you know seven point five percent GDP growth, and we are fastest growing economy. And we've overtaken, you know, UK. And in 10 years, in 5 years, in 8 years, in 20 years, you know, we are going to be number 4, number 3, number 2, you know, number 1, and all that kind of a thing. That is fine as far as, you know, uh, a discussion at certain level. But you see, do not neglect the actual felt, lived experience of people. If you, if you say that inflation has come down from 7% to 4% or 5%, that's a figure for you and me. But somebody who goes to the market and buys uh, you know, tomatoes or vegetables or milk or gas or, you know, they, they know, uh, they just don't bother about what's the percentage. There's no fine point in it because that's the lived experience. Lived experience, you know, it will, if not today, tomorrow, it will have to come out. If it is, may not be in the form of, you know, rioting or throwing stones or shouting slogans, but there are different modes of expression. And I have a feeling that this will not go unexpressed when there is a, 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 an avenue for them to express, maybe through ballot box or you know other things. One, and that is the reason why I think this government is desperate to divert the attention of the people from these. You know, it's, it's, it's after all, there is, this is a technique of foregrounding. You know, when you go to the ballot uh, box, to the booth, polling booth, what is foregrounded in your mind? Is it the price rise, is it unemployment or is it Ram Mandir? So the reason why this government is very desperate about Ram Mandir and you know, making a huge spectacle of it, you know, uh, practically kick-starting the next election, uh, general election campaign on the 22nd of uh, January. All this is that because they are very, very acutely aware, I think, of the deep economic crisis that people are facing. Otherwise, otherwise, remember Venkat, 
when World Hunger Index told us that a lot of Indians sleep hungry, go to bed hungry. The kind of reaction the government and the government ministers have uh, shown us that you know they are biased and it is untrue, it has no basis and then one minister, I don't want to name that minister, one minister even went to the extent of saying that you know I left home at 4 o'clock in the morning, went to the airport, went to you know some remote part of the country at least a meeting, again rushed back to the airport and caught the uh, flight to another big city and in between when I was running around some call comes and you know I pick up and say from the other uh, uh, end they say are you hungry, I said I am hungry, then they put the phone down, look and you know uh, there are people. You know, you know, trivialization of uh, methodology. Okay. But when the government denied that so vehemently that India is not hungry, in the same breath, the Prime Minister of the country announces that 85 crore people will be given free ration for the next five years. Why? If people are not hungry, people have incomes, and you know, you, you pulled you know, 29 to 30 crores of people out of poverty. If that is really true, if the government believes that to be true, why give 85 crore people free ration, free food for the next five years? Which means that you are aware that there is an economic crisis and you have absolutely no wherewithal, policy wherewithal to deal with them, to address them because you have no cohesive economic ideology or cohesive economic thinking. Therefore you go to these kind of a numbing practices. You, you numb them with, you know, spectacles. You make normal things look abnormal. Abnormal things look normal. You know, hunger, which is abnormal, they want to normalize that. And, you know, for instance, look at the normal thing. You know, you and I probably did not hear about uh, G20 earlier. But you know, every petrol station, every every uh, railway station, every bus stop, every you know, uh, uh, every junction in Bangalore, everywhere, you have G20. As to as to, they made it look like that's a normal thing. Normal thing because uh, earlier it was Indonesia, it is India. Today it's not India; it's Brazil. It's gone away already. That is the normal, and, and no other country made a huge big. Uh, uh, song and dance about it, but then we we made a huge effort, spent a lot of money to make this very normal thing abnormal, as though the entire world came and prostrated before us and said, "Please, we have completely at a loss. We do not know what to do about you know the entire problem in the world. Please guide us." And you know, we um, very uh, we deigned to say, "Like, look, get up and we will we'll, we'll, we'll lead you." So it it was made to look like that. And you see, uh, then the distortion of reality, creating illusion out of a completely different kind of reality and also using, leveraging religion, ancient texts, for, for instance, I mean, look at this, um, you know, the entire uh, slogan of G, G20, Vasudhaiva Kutumbaka. Venkat, if you allow me a couple of minutes, I want to explain this because this, this needs to be explained. The, the, the phrase of Vasudhaiva Kutumbakam is not an assertion of the creed of India. You know, it is found, a shloka is found in a very minor Upanishad called Maho Upanishad. It's not one of the uh, big ten Upanishads, not the major Upanishads. It's not uh, Isha, uh, Katha, Kena, Prashna, Munda, Mandukya, Taittari, Aitreya, Chandogya, or Bhradarandika. It, it doesn't figure in these things. The minor Upanishad called Mahopanishad. It says, I am Nijaha, Paro Veti Ganana Iti, Lagu Chetasam. Udara Chirita Namtu was the Heva Kutumbakam. For those with small minds, they reckon some as theirs and some as others. But people with broad mind, they consider the entire earth as one family. It's just a descriptive statement. It is not a statement of assertion of the creed of India. It is not an assertion of the creed of Sanatana Dharma. 
let's not get this confused but they are trying to market it this way so they, they resort to this kind of a gimmickry this, this kind of a falsehood this kind of a, a fakery this is what they have done now I want to question if you think that the entire world is one family why do you say these are not our people, these are not our people, these are not our people, those are not our people, that's it, Manipur is not ours, something else is not ours. Why do you, why do you treat people differently? If that is the creed, that's not the creed. You've never believed in it. In fact, that, that, that sloka, the first part which describes the narrow-minded is the one which fits you, actually. To treat people as their own and to treat other people as others, is the one which is which describes your mindset much better than anything else so you know so they, they resort to religion they, they resort to mandir they, they resort to these issues they resort to hate they resort to you know othering they resort to scriptures you know falsify things falsify the narratives in order to divert this attention from the real economic and political issues now manipur is burning Manipur has not stopped burning, although your headlines are dominated by Mandir, dominated by something else, dominated by Maldives, dominated by something else, etc., etc. But it, it, it continues to burn. It, it's, it's more than 100 days it's burning. You know, is, is Manipur not, not a part of our country? How can you push Manipur out of your national imagination, from your national consciousness? And, you know, act as though everything is normal. What, what worries, what should worry everybody is, you know, 2002, 2022, 23, just 20 years, Gujarat to Manipur. And now, as, as, as days go by, as years go by, that, that gap is going to reduce. It could be, you know, um, don't think that Manipur is very far away. Uh, then you will think that you know if something happens in, in Andhra Pradesh, you might think it's happening in Andhra Pradesh, not in Karnataka. Now Karnataka people might think that way, and Andhra people might think something is happening in UDP, something is happening in Karnataka. It's not ours. But you know, eventually the whole thing is going to catch up with everybody. This is the kind of uh, you know the, the 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 convergence of politics and economics, and you know this kind of a falsehood and false narrative is leading us to. Yeah. They say if you have a pool, you can't dirty one side of the pool and say that's the dirty side of the yes. pool. Yes. You it can't even empty one part of the pool. pool. Yes. So it is going to spread and that's the... While we spoke that the economic policy seems like an event to event, moving from one thing to the other and there's not much of thought and there's voodoo economics behind it, there seems to be a superstructure which is running all of it. The Hindutva ideology, RSS being one of them. Uh, I wanted your view about while the economics is taking space, uh, the politics is changing, what role does this structure do? Because BJP is just one arm of it. There are main multi-level hydra and then there are many other things which are happening. I wanted to help our audience and contextualize how this superstructure is playing a role culturally, economically, politically, and that's shaping what we see. So those events, sporadic events, which we spoke about, uh, may not always be coming out of a superstructure, but it's part of the larger system. I wanted you to help us contextualize these two things. Yeah. You know, uh, by now, I think the pattern, because we have, we've been living with this for the last 10 years, it's, it's not just yesterday. You know, if, you, if, if it is just yesterday or, you know, six months ago, or one year ago, probably we need people like Venkat to put us together, put all these things together and explain the pattern. But now it's, it's more than clear to everybody. For the last 10 years it's been happening. You know, um, I somehow get this impression as I always think that, you know, politics is, is not divorced from economy, and economy is not divorced from politics. Now look at this. You have uh, a loose economic philosophy called neoliberalism. Each one has their own understanding of uh, what it is, but, you know, essentially what it means is that one part of it is that, you know, rich people, when they become richer, you know, still they job, they create jobs, and the and the income trickles down to the uh, the bottom. 
therefore you protect the strong they will create jobs the good people and let them become richer and eventually you'll also become rich hmm. this is the rough kind of a thing uh there could be a lot of nuances in this, but then there's the broad kind of thing. Now, look at the political counterpart which is in operation today. Hindus are good. Hmm. And if you accept that and give unto them, they're, they're benevolent people. They don't harm you. But only thing is you just have to live unto them. So, it is, it is always feeding the, 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 the top dog, the majority, the, the the stronger, the bigger, you know, and then ask asking the other people down the line to wait for their munificence, their their benefits. benefits. This is what is happening today in India. Now, the reason why I say this is that you know I give you a common man. A couple of gas cylinders, five kilos of ration, but I give my friend five eight books, ten ropes, ten, you know, uh, sea boats, or five sea boats, or you know, huge government assets and public assets in the form of the private uh, pri public sector undertakings. You give them away at, at a cheap price. And also write down the loans that were taken by them to the tune of about 25 lakh crores. Just just write them off. You know, 80,000 rupees, 80,000 crores you own. Give, give us a couple of thousand rupees, thousand crores and you know, write it off. That is the kind of thing that is happening. And why is this happening is because they believe that, you know, they should, their own people either in politics or in the economy, their own people, it belongs to them only. That this country is owned by a particular religion. This economy is owned by a particular set of people. Their people. Here, their people. They're their people. This is the larger picture that is emerging from whatever has been happening in the last 10 years. I thought it was very beautifully structured. The new liberal economics and the and the Hindutva majoritarianism was very beautifully parallel, put in parallels. And I think it's a lovely way to explain it. Can you also dwell how within that Hindu system, the caste itself plays a role, and RSS nearly uses that in its favor because that also seems to have a hierarchy within that somebody else is also the top. Oh, you have time for it. Yeah. Oh, wonderful. Okay. This is something uh, which is very, very important because you see a, 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 a huge effort is being made to bring in this kind of an old narrative of, you know, we had a wonderful society, we had a wonderful structure, we have to go back to that, last 70 years have been an aberration, you know, in including one important minister in the government who is not who was not a, who has not been a politician even that minister went on saying that you know um, in a in a thousand years or two thousand or you know five thousand years of indian history last 70 years was a small aberration and we have come back to the mainstream that that's that's the kind of narrative that is being you know put out these days now let us see what is that kind of a narrative and if you want you know, uh, to go back to what the humanity has been doing for the majority of its existence on this planet, then probably you will have to go back to the, the savannas, isn't it? Because that's where the majority of the time the human race has lived. Sapiens have lived there. Sapiens have, uh, even, even agriculture revolution was you know, an aberration. It was supposed to about seven to 10,000 years old. But what, you know, what happened uh, before that and what, so that is not the logic, you know. After the Renaissance, after the scientific discoveries, we have reached a stage in our evolution. Now, for the majority of its time on the planet, the human being has thought that the earth was flat. 
do you, that does it that, does that mean that we have to go back to that does it mean but look at this look at this uh, you know the the, the kind of uh, or national dharma that we have had for a long time we have had the the existence of varnashrama dharma for a long time on in this land doesn't justify to say that look that is the best isn't it and what does it mean it means brahmano asya mukham asit bahu rajanya hakrutah guru talasya yat vaisya padabhyam shudro ajayat that some people were born from here some people were born from here some people were born from here some people were born from the feet so there is a hierarchy there's a structure you see look at look at you know continuous long drawn battles for the last 100 150 years in this country for equality people were not allowed to walk on the streets because they were polluting those streets they were not supposed to walk on the streets they were not supposed to walk let alone enter the temple but they were not supposed to walk on the streets that lead led to the temple or streets that were around the temple in that kind of a thing you want to go back to that and and the and the and the layered thing you know there was there is a caste which which can go up to the uh, sanctum sanctorum garbhagraha there are there is a caste which can just you know stand outside the sanctum center there is another caste which can stand just 3 feet away from there is another caste you know come to the fourth fold you 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 have uh, in the fourth fold there are many jatis many castes which you know the one is allowed to stand uh, um 10 feet away from the idol 12 feet from the idol 15 feet from the idol 17 feet from the idol 19 feet from the idol 20 and other things other people are not even allowed to enter the temple not even not even allowed to walk on the streets leading to the temple not on the streets you know around the temple that is the kind of hierarchical society that we have had and it and it prevailed for a long time and you know there there were there were, uh, there were uh, uh, clashes both ideological clashes argumentation for the age of consent for a girl to get married was 8 years in 1880s and the, when there was an attempt to make that 8 to 9 just by one year there was a huge uproar and opposition and you know in marriage adoption divorce inheritance there were battles fought do we want to go back to that you know just because you know that kind of injustice lived for hundreds and thousands of years doesn't make that a just system so what we had in the last 70 years or 80 years or 100 years is not an aberration it is an improvisation of our civilization where we are now after long years of struggle ready to respect another human being respect of caste respect of religion with respect of birth with respect of religion respect of faith respect of no faith as an equal which means that we have come to a stage where we have constructed a state a state structure where all of us have our relation with that state structure as citizens not as practitioners of one religion or another religion not as speakers of one religion or another religion not as inhabitants of one rel- one region or another region as citizens equal citizens now if you want to strike at the roots of this equality and privilege one region or one religion or one language and compel the rest of them to be subordinate to that those people who practice that religion or speak that language or inhabit that region then it is a retrograde step it is the thing that goes against the grain of what this republic stands for what this republic in modern day should stand for what this republic has 
come to after decades and centuries of struggle for equality. Now, you might say that has there been equality? There may not have been an, an equality. But the point is this, Venkat, that look, I look at this society and find pockets of inequality or structures which perpetuate inequality and disagree with them, dissent from them and fight against those values, fight against those structures. This is one. I may not be successful, but here is somebody who would say that inequality is good. Let us preserve that. In my mind, people who fight against inequality may not be successful in removing those inequalities are much better than those people who say that this inequality is good, it should be perpetuated. Get my point? Yes, yes. It is not a question of whether you had inequality or not. The question is whether you have been dissenting from inequality or not, whether you have been fighting against that inequality or not. And I would disagree with anybody who would say this inequality needs to be revived. This inequality needs to be brought back in some form or, other, form or the other. They may not tell you that you know they are they are they are they're batting for bringing the thing. They might you know uh, they, they might camouflage their uh, uh, their their uh, their, uh, their uh, um, projections and uh, their constructions in very different ways. They they could they could call this that kind of a rajya, this kind of a rajya, this kind of a uh, rule, that kind of a rule. You know we had this uh, uh, thousands of years ago. We had this and that etc. Now, you see, I, I often hear people saying that, look, there was no discrimination. But what about uh, Manusmati? What about Yajnavalkya Smati? What about Parashara Smati? There are inequalities there, very clearly laid down. Who should marry whom? Who should be uh, eligible for inheritance? What should, what, is, is divorce allowed? What happens to a woman when she is uh, widowed? Is she eligible for remarriage? What happens to her progeny? What happens to uh, the progeny of a, a couple who are from different ashramas? You know, one is uh, uh, the, 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 the first and the, the other one is uh, fourth. What happens if the man is fourth and the uh, woman is uh, number one? You know, this, these are all clear, clearly laid down. Do we want to go back to that? This is the kind of questions I think at one level, I don't think, I don't expect every level of society would debate these things, but at some level I think these things will have to be debated and clarity attained and see through the kind of project that is in operation today, be it uh, in temple opening, be it in uh, kind of, uh, you know, going back to, you know, old values and treating the 70 years as an aberration, treating, uh, you know, our uh, liberal, secular credentials as uh, against the grain of, you know, our land. There are, there are people today who are confidently saying that this land belongs to Hindus. Hmm. They are saying it very confidently. You know, they used, about 10, 12 years ago, they used to say it not so openly. They used to, you know, remember, they used to say, we are... But, they used to fight shy. Today the fangs are bared. The gloves are off. It's a bare knuckle fight that we are in today. This is the kind of polit political economy that makes general mix. And it is a social mix. It is, you know, mythological mix. This is the kind of polity, this is the kind of economy, this is the kind of uh, society, this is the kind of republic that is now in front of us. Now the question is, do we allow this to take its course and take us back to, you know, hundreds of years? and bring back, they won't state it now, but eventually bring back all those 
oppressive structures, all those oppressive practices, all those uh, discriminatory practices, would you allow them or should we put a stop to this? This is the question that we need to confront. This is the question that we need to confront and also demand answers. And those answers should guide our actions in our economy, in our polity, in our culture, in our public conversations, in our public actions. Yeah, when you bring all those things, I, I get reminded when Sen talks about how economics and freedom are not very different. They're the same. If you don't have freedom, you're not going to make economic uh, development. Um, when you bring all those things, when we are fighting to become an economy which provides for everyone, we're also fighting for some of the freedoms which are going away. Uh, I wanted to end this session of discussion with you helping us understand what is if you are from Karnataka, what is your role? If you are a citizen, what is your role? How to think about the dissent itself? And what is the role we play in communicating it? Because there is a need to aggregate these voices to say this is not what we dreamt as a nation. This 70 years is not an aberration. This is the path of progress. Not everything is right, as you pointed out. But the fight towards inequality cannot be just pushed away and said it's wrong. And that's absolutely defying what we stood for when we created this nation. So I wanted your view about how we go about it. I know it, nothing can be prescriptive because it's a, it's a very difficult thing, but your views about how we take this fight or this challenge and how do we take it forward so that we can inspire ourselves and move forward with this. Vinkit, this is very really important because you see, there is, a, there is a very powerful narrative that is built over years not only here but throughout the world, is that you know, you have to sacrifice your freedoms in order to become prosperous. This is exactly what I told you about the neoliberal, you know, you, 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 become, you, you accept the subordination, you, you uh, empower the rich and wait for the, the wealth that is created to trickle down, you know, this, this is something. But you see, economies everywhere in the world have not progressed because the freedoms were restricted. They might see, for instance, even this government says that you know we are the fastest growing, and you know we have we have achieved that, and we have achieved that, and you, you know, because they 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 go on closing the society, they become less and less transparent, they become less and less democratic. They don't allow discussion. They don't allow free flow of information. They allow only propaganda. They manipulate data and show that, you know, it happened with Soviet Union, probably it is happening in China, it is probably happening everywhere, other places also. It's also happening here that it is, it is uh, less freedom always make, makes a society less prosperous. It is, it is proven the world over. The freer the society, the agency is owned by individuals. That we, 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 are the, we are the people who are writing our futures, who are determining our futures, who are working towards our futures, our prosperity. Now, this kind of a freedom of expression, freedom to you know, practice, freedom to ideate, freedom to express, freedom to articulate, freedom to associate, freedom to write, freedom to talk, freedom to dissent, freedom to question. These are the hallmarks of a prosperous society. You, know, I, you, you, you can put a lot of people in, in prison and feed them very well, make them strong, but that doesn't mean anything in a human society. So, you know, you know, that kind of a narrative that freedom and prosperity are antagonistic to each other. They are not complementary. That you need to sacrifice one in order to achieve the other. If you are free, you, you sacrifice your prosperity. But if you are prosperity, you have to necessarily sacrifice your freedom. That is not a tenable formulation anymore. History has proved it repeatedly in front of our eyes. Even 20th century, 21st century, we have seen those things. So this is something that we need to first of all disabuse ourselves from. 
by by demanding freedom by demanding discussion by demanding the right to dissent please do not feel guilty that you are somehow or the other harming the economic prospects of the nation please don't do that you take that out of your mind you know the the the, the people who demand freedom necessarily demand prosperity they are linked if you work for prosperity you are necessarily working for freedom if you are working for freedom you are necessarily working for prosperity this is my formulation and i am born out you know by the recent history throughout the world and and the freedom and prosperity are the same they are synonymous um reminds me of this beautiful poem they are indivisible uh, indivisible they are it reminds me of this very beautiful poem by rabindranath tagore kachar pakhi which is a discussion between two birds one inside the prison and outside and both seem to be giving arguments of why they need and in, in fact the arguments of those within the prison the bird is very beautifully similar to what you said that that you know people can give you this idea that for prosperity you have to sacrifice your economic freedom and that's what the bird kind of says and tagore very beautifully takes it forward and explains um so thank you so much i think the discussion was quite detailed and informative uh, and what i would like to really thank you for is that uh people and thinkers like you put a uh, lot of the things which are happening into a structure it archives dissent and archiving of the dissent is very critical because then only it can be amplified uh, we can get a lexicon we can get words and to how to say it so uh, really a big thank you from edina and also from all of us that you came all th- all the way here and shared your thoughts they are quite elaborate we could nearly make multiple sessions out of it so thank you so much for coming uh, and to the audience themselves uh, please do subscribe to edina edina is a platform uh, which is from the community in some sense we want to aggregate information from the community and not you an information which is what is happening to their society what is happening in their neighborhood and then put it all together because if we don't aggregate this information we would not understand which fe- freedoms are compromised and how do we aggregate these voices through a media is one of the attempts but there are many other th- such institutions which are working independently to bring news from the public so really would like uh, and tell people to like and subscribe us but equally go and listen to other independent journalism independent media houses because they are also doing really good work so thank you so much and thank you so much thank you thank you thank you mattashtu vishesha video galannu nodalu mattu hosa video gala bagge tiliyalu idina.com youtube channel subscribe maadi mattu bell icon click maadi